What's up, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast. I'm Scott Baer alongside Tori McElhaney and Chris Rim. And loyal listeners, it's been too long. Yeah. It really has. We've missed you. Have you missed us? <laughs> That's the better question. I know. Have you missed us? I hope so, <laughs> at least a little bit. Uh, there were some combines and owners' meetings and a oh, uh, big quarterback trade and yeah. a number of different things that kept us more focused on the website as opposed to the podcast. But we're back, and we're bringing you uh, on this speed train towards the NFL draft, which is less than two weeks away right now. I'm just glad we made it here. I know. There was one point in the, uh, like, a couple, I guess it was around the time that Matt Ryan was traded where I was just like, we're not going to get there. We're not going to get to the draft. We're <laughs> all just going to go to sleep for a couple weeks and then wake up and it'll be draft time. Yeah. That didn't happen. Nope. But but instead, it's been all mock drafts all the time. Hopefully, you guys have taken a look at the one that Chris Rim and I put together, which I've boldly predicted will get 32 out of 32 correct. <laughs> nice. The insight. I'm mad. Not. I am mad though that you didn't say the same thing about our mock draft from two weeks ago. Yeah, uh. be, because you intentionally sabotaged it with the Georgia <laughs> players. <laughs> hey, now I didn't. It's not sabotage. And, hold on. And in the intro, you specifically said that you wanted to do such a bad job that you would never get asked back again. <laughs> that is true. I hate for those of you. Okay, so those of you who have been following me since I've been covering a, like the Falcons. This was even before I came here. I hate mock drafts with a burning passion because <laughs> they just annoy the absolute crap out of me. It's just pe people have no idea what they're doing. They're just throwing darts at a wall, just hoping one of them hits. <laughs> That's all mock drafts are. And if anyone thinks any differently, they're lying to themselves. As a minor programming note, stay tuned next Monday for, <laughs> for, for Tori McElhaney's <laughs> mock, next mock draft. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Chris and I are doing a mock draft. Yeah, that'll that's be right. fun. And then there's going to be some seven round mocks, which used to be the bane of everyone's existence because you'd have uh, to like yeah. blindly just point to a a a page in, in right. the athletics beast draft guide. Which that is still what I do. Like <laughs> I still just go through and I'm like, you know what? Who works here? And I just look at what Dane did. No, you just go through a a a, a couple of uh, pro football focus mock draft simulators. You wait till you get an A from the computer system and you're good. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So <laughs> there's going to be lots more good draft conversation coming up as we head towards. The big weekend itself when the Falcons pick for the first time at number eight overall. So that brings us to our question of the week. Uh, we've kind of danced around these points before, and we all know that it's going to be best player available, this, that, and the other thing. But we're going to talk about two positions of, I don't want to say weakness, but real uncertainty uh, for the need. need. It's need. Positions of need. Yes. That's a good term. Yeah. For the Falcons, you all know what it is before we say it, right? It's edge rusher and wide receiver. Not only is there not a ton of talent there, there aren't very many bodies. Nope. They still have to flesh out the depth chart. And only one major acquisition point left this offseason to do it, and that is the NFL draft coming up. So we're going to break down not just what they should pick at number eight. We are going to talk about that. We're also going to, going to give you a lay of the land of both of those positions and how they can remedy these situations, both in the NFL draft and as we move forward. This is not going to be a single-year fix. It's just right. not possible with the state of the Falcons roster, and that's okay. Not everything was built in one day. So we're going to go over all those things. Before we do that, uh, we do need to give a big thank you to our sponsor, Microsoft Windows 11, the official operating system of the NFL, and the Atlanta Falcons. The all-new Windows 11 is here to bring you closer to what you love like this Falcons Final Whistle podcast. Learn all about that awesome, the awesome new features of Windows 11 at windows.com. So, thank you Woo. to Microsoft. We're pumped about that. Uh, I think Falcons fans are definitely pumped about the number eight overall they pick. They should be. And the mailbag is full of, and I know that all of our timelines are full of questions of which position, right? Which position? Edge rusher, wide receiver. Edge rusher, cornerback. But I thought in our written round table of this, Chris Rim, to my right, brought up a, a great point that the who is more important than the what position, right? Yeah. That it's not just, let's go take an edge rusher, we'll take that guy. Right. It's got to be about who is there at the time that you're selecting. And number eight is kind of an interesting spot because it's very unpredictable whether some of these top-level guys are even going to be there. Yeah, I think – 
when you look at like the top guys, as I wrote in our question of the week, like when you look at the the big four as we as they, I think we should call them. Uh-huh. Like, uh, Henceforth, <laughs> <laughs> trademark that <laughs> right. Aiden. Falcons final whistle podcast. Chris <laughs> <laughs> like Aiden Hutchinson, um, Kayvon, uh, Jermaine Johnson, and and Trayvon Walker. I think I think the gap between whoever's the fourth in that group. I think it's in mock drafts and projections. It's been Jermaine. Whoever's the fourth in that group. I think there's a bigger gap between him and the next guy yep. than there is between the fourth receiver, whoever you want to say as Jahan Dotson or uh, maybe Traylon Burks, whoever you want to say that is, there's a bigger gap between that guy and say like uh, George Pickens. Yep. So I think if you, if you're at, and, and Pickens is, might be multiple down the line because of the, the, you know, small sample size. So I think whoever you pick at eight, like Scott was saying, it matters more about who's there. Do you reach for who's the, whoever you consider the fifth guy, which I, I don't know is George Karlaftis or, or someone like that, um, or do you want? <laughs> <Nope. laughs> Scott you, says no. <laughs> <laughs> versus like grabbing a guy like a like a Garrett Wilson, I think it makes sense in that situation. But I would still prioritize edge as a position over yeah. receiver. But in that situation, I like Garrett Wilson over Karlaftis. Uh, but that's, I'm just a guy. It's just my take. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> just a simple man. Just a with guy. Simple Terry Fondas makes these decisions. <laughs> <laughs> we don't get paid the big bucks. No, I wish we did. No, I'm kidding. I, I wouldn't want to be in that position. Um, I so th- I actually think in our written portion, I also kind of said what Chris did, but in different terms, where I was just kind of like, I think, going back to what you were saying about the top edge rushers and the next round of edge rushers, there's a bigger gap than there are with receivers. And because of that, and because if you look at the lay of the land in terms of who's picking in the top 10, a lot of those teams need edge rushers. I think it's more of a possibility that we see good receivers fall than we do see good edge rushers fall. And so because of that, I prioritize edge rushers at number eight. I also cannot I mean you cannot look at this draft and not look at it as a complete whole and I think that's what a lot of people are forgetting forgetting is that you cannot overlook having those two second round picks and what you can do with that you can go after two second round receivers and they're going to be some pretty good guys that are still on the board at that point or if there's a specific receiver that falls into the late round of the first the the late picks of the first round you have two second round picks you have two third-round picks, if you wanted to deal something to get back into the first round, to get the receiver or whoever it is that you wanted, do it. If that's what you want, if you're in love with this guy, do it. I mean, I think that's the thing is I I can't just sit here and say, oh, with the number eight pick, like they go after this person, this person. It's like you have to think about the way that the draft, especially those first three rounds, are going to shake out and see kind of what happens in this first round to understand – okay, we have these two second-round picks. What do we want to do with them? It's When you look at the top 50s and the, uh, the overall rankings by people smarter and more experienced in this field than us, that you do see these top four edge rushers pretty high, and then you kind of, generally speaking, see the receivers in that next tier. Yeah. Yeah. And then you start thinking about, okay, so what's the difference – yeah, and I'm going to go down a trade down rabbit hole for just a little Ayo. bit. Uh, is that you think, okay, well, Garrett Wilson sounds great at eight, but Chris Olave, if I'm pronouncing his last name Alave. right. Alave. Alave. Alave sounds really like, good at 15 right. with yeah. an extra pick. Right. Exactly. But mm-hmm. so that's how I feel about the receivers. With the edge rushers, if we're talking about the, the, the top four, I did kind of a – who would you make the pick, make the call in the in the last bear mail that I did? And so many people came with PFF accepted trades saying that they can get Jermaine Johnson from Florida State, an edge rusher, with a trade down. Right. Would that scare you? If Johnson is your target, I'm not saying that he is, but if Johnson is your target at eight, would you feel comfortable trying to make a play down and still get him, or do you think that that's too risky? I, I, I don't think I would feel comfortable making a trade down to get him. But, yeah, I think that there are too many needy – edge rusher needy teams. Yeah. I mean, I think that if he's – I don't think uh, Kayvon will be there for the Giants. Uh, yeah. And I think the Giants should take – would take Jermaine with either five or seven. They're probably going to take 
offensive line at five, yeah. him at seven. If, I think if Kayvon's there at five, they'd probably take him at five. But right. I think they take an edge rusher at five or seven paired with um, – an O lineman, the guy from NC State, or maybe mm-hmm. someone else. Yeah, that's another thing is uh, I think you can't talk about the edge rushers without also talking about the tackles that are in this, like the the top yeah. ten. Um, and that's another thing I wouldn't be surprised if the Fal- I know we're talking about wide receivers and edge rushers in this question of the week because it's you know the fa- arguably the Falcons' greatest needs are those two position groups, but. They could use an offensive tackle, and Definitely. if someone's there, it wouldn't. Sur- I know that's not. I've said this before, and I, I, I know it's not a sexy pick, but I don't hate that. I don't hate them going after an offensive tackle either at number eight. And you talk about the 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 top four and somewhat of a drop off. It seems with an offensive tackle, it's Neil Ekwanu, Cross, and Trevor Penning maybe floating a little bit yeah. underneath that. Right. And you talk about needing like a real a hole. Trevor Penning seems to wear that <laughs> as a badge of honor, yeah. right? And Arthur Smith loves those guys. Loves those guys. <laughs> yeah. So so then if you're not going to get a tackle high, then how much of a drop-off yep. is there? Uh, then there's the, s- the sauce gardener of it all, although it seems like the at least the buzz of those talking to scouts and presenting you know mocks and some of these r- reports is that sauce gardener may – almost likely not be an option at number eight. Right. It yeah. seems like that that's the way it's trending. I can yeah. see him going top five. Yeah. Easily. It seems like the Jets, if right. it seemed like they would take mm. him at four yeah. and then grab the – I think with this conversation too is like, like what you were saying with trading down, I think that the, when you think about the Falcons, they're going to be likely the first team to take a receiver. And then the team after them probably won't take a receiver in the in the Seahawks. Right. Like the next team that will likely take a receiver would be the Jets. Um, and it's like you were saying, if if, if I can tr- if I, if the edge guys are gone or if the, whoever the fuck was over the are gone, and you can trade down and get a Chris Olave, you mm-hmm. get maybe you get Jameson Williams, maybe you get one of those kind of guys. You know wh- why not? I you know especially if you can get another big time twenty twenty three pick. Yeah, out of it because because the 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 Jets seem uh, at, at least the the way it look it, the way it seems is is like they would take the best defensive player at four the best offensive player at ten I mean mm-hmm. Robert Sala is a defensive minded guy so right. maybe they maybe they double dip but it seems you know you'd want to get Zach Wilson some help right um, and you know they kind of have a guy like Garrett and Elijah Moore with the same skill set so maybe they want a bigger guy or something like that but yeah it it, it would seem like trading down if. It works out that way. I know it kind of took us down this route. We weren't going there, but <laughs> no, we it just popped there. up in my head. Like <laughs> the, the the Jets seem like the team that most likely in the before the Falcons who could take someone that mm-hmm. could alter their plan. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if 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 you're looking for that big wideout that you'd feel a lot more comfortable doing that for Alave or somebody in that mid, he's not a mid tier, but. Uh, it, in, in that range right. than trading down and hoping you can get Johnson at 12 or Johnson at 13 or what, what have you. That seems yeah. unlikely, especially with the scenario that you were painting that uh, I, I too am with you that this whole, uh, this, all the shade being thrown at, at, at Kayvon. Yeah. I don't really yeah. buy it. Yeah, I don't think that's going to show up on draft day. Sometimes you, you, you get a lot of these, it happens almost I'm gonna every year. I'm going to say it for Arthur Smith. You get these false narratives. Uh, <laughs> oh. Okay. And then Arthur, if you're listening, you've converted Scott. <laughs> you have. You, you get these false narratives out there. I think that's one. I think he goes really high. Yeah. And maybe a tackle falls. But anyway, yeah. so it's it's a very interesting thing about what they can do at eight and what then they could do later in the draft, mm-hmm. right? But the one thing that we can universally agree upon is that these – Two positions need tons of help. So let's just take a look at the edge rusher spot right now, okay? <laughs> right right now you have Lorenzo Carter. Mm-hmm. I'm staring at you, Tori, because I don't have the answer. Is here on a one-year one deal? Year. Mm-hmm. He's here on a one-year deal. Essentially, e- everyone Everybody is on is. a one-year deal. I, the, <laughs> the amount of times that – The deal is Hayward, is, I think. Yeah. Uh, and Marcus Mariota. And Marcus Mariota. Yeah. Right. That's the thing is we write these announcements that go up on the site, and the amount of times that I have written – so-and-so is coming from the Bears, the Lions, or the <laughs> Titans on a one-year deal is I, – I don't even know how many times I've written that. <laughs> right, It's true, but you get familiarity for a guy who's probably not going to be around very long yeah. yep. and that you preserve the financial flexibility that's so yep. um, coveted in 2023. So so you have Lorenzo Carter on one side. I'm looking at an rlads.com draft, or a depth chart. This is not mine. And then you have Ade Ogundeji at the other mm-hmm. 
James Vodder's under contract. Quentin Bell was a practice squad player, I think, at this point. Yeah. Um, also there, they you know, are probably going to run more of a three-man front with Grady, Marlon Davidson, Taquan, Anthony Rush mixed in up front. So you've got all these. These are the pieces that you have. Yeah. This is not the group that you can go into 2022 with. It's just not. I'm of the opinion, Tory ranked the needs one through five. I would even say that a second edge rusher or a second receiver is more valuable than some of these other positions. Totally. If you could do a 1A, 1B, 2A, 2C. Right. So we all seem to agree what? that that, yeah, that was a little. That was. We'll just, was. We'll just one, skip over it. One yeah. A, I, one, I did. I one was a. I was gonna, B, I was gonna let it rock. Two A, two B. <laughs> okay. I fixed it. We're there back. We go. <laughs> oh my god. I think it's better that way than somebody on the driving on their car. They heard it and they're like, like, "What? That doesn't." This girl. Yeah, I'm not a math <laughs> major. That don't make no sense. But anyway, <laughs> we don't do math here. <laughs> they, they need a lot of help. Yes. So, and look, we're not going to say who the best option in the fifth round is, right? Because we don't really know that. But when you look at it, that's why I think ideally it seems to me, and I may say this when we're talking about the wideouts too, they need a premier talent mm -hmm. to help here. So if you could get a Jermaine Johnson type, who I think is just like scheme fit city in terms of what they like mm -hmm. to do, a, a, a bigger guy who can play the run, a strong player, who can still get after the quarterback – but then that's not it, right? So you've got – do you need more than one edge rusher in these in these five quote-unquote premium picks? We're, we're, we're talking the five picks in the first 82. And, again, I know when, when it, it's the same thing. It'll be who over what right. in the third round too. But I'm just saying if we're thinking big picture perspective, given the names that I just listed, do they have to come out of this draft with more than one person that can, that can contribute? I'm not ready to pull the trigger on – multiple edge rushers in this draft um, just because I think you are still buying your time. And I don't think that it's entirely necessary to fully reach for a guy in the fourth or fifth round when you have another draft next year that you could potentially use a higher pick on another edge rusher. That I, Here's the thing. I'm just really conflicted about what direction they're going in. And I'm not 100% sold on multiple edge rushers just yet. So if I can just to repeat, right? yeah. it sounds to me like you're saying don't think of the 2022 draft as a way to fix the 2022 product. Right. You're wondering are they going to look at it as a – one acquisition point in a multi-acquisition point, multi-year yeah. process of rebuilding the roster. Right. Right, because that's yes. two separate things. Because I'm saying, how can they fix the, the 2022 issues they have at this position? And you're saying, I'm, that's not a priority for you. Yeah, that's not a priority. So I'm in the camp of 22 is a wash. And okay. I will say that. I just don't. I think you go into 2020, 2022. And compete like heck for and every single and win. Yes. But. But focus on the big picture. You have to look at 23. And that's also why I just wrote a column that ran uh, today on Tuesday when we're recording this podcast about potentially drafting a quarterback this year. I am team anti-drafting a quarterback this year because I think you're in a better position next year to go after a quarterback that you want, whether it's trading for him, getting him on the free agency market, or and or drafting him. And I kind of feel the same way about multiple positions. I don't think it's entirely necessary that you get – these big time guys in right now, especially when you have projectively over a hundred million dollars in cap space next year. I kind of look at, I, I kind of look at everything the Falcons are doing right now as kind of what you were saying. It's the law. It's a long haul health overall health of the organization and the franchise than it is fixing what you have in 2022. I say, just get through 2022. It, it seems like there's go ahead. No, I, was gonna, I think if in terms of rebuild, we're talking about rebuilding the edge for this year. I think if Ojabo is there in the second round and you got <laughs> Jermaine in the first, yeah, I would probably take that I shot. I would too. On yeah, a, on a guy who had you know a top fifteen grade just a couple mo months ago before his injury, mm -hmm. and obviously it depends on what the Falcons think about him. But but yeah, I don't think you need to load up on this position and feel like you have to rebuild the the edge rusher and defensive line in in this draft I don't know if I don't think you want to put all your eggs in one basket in terms of 
waiting until a year to get someone or mm-hmm. waiting to to make the move. But I do agree that you don't you don't have to focus on this year to just transform that that room. But if you have a shot, an opportunity to take a yeah. guy who had a, a high, super high grade before an injury, mm-hmm. and you can, and you're a team who's not probably not a title contender in 2022 mm-hmm. and you can you can wait for that player to get back i i feel like why not when you have two yeah. second round picks but you might have to miss out on a receiver if you take mm-hmm. right ojabo at 43 but if, if for example th- but if if you're thinking about this as a longer term play i was actually going to like going to ask you guys if he would be attractive to you at number 43 or if you had to move up or whatever, given the nature of his injury and the explosiveness, explosiveness that can be robbed. But I'm in Chris's camp, too. Mm-hmm. I would definitely go for it. And I'm just looking on the back end of this. This wasn't part of the script. But also, so if we're saying that, look, they need multiple edge rushers, well, I just took a look at what's at who's available in terms of veteran edge rushers, and there are a ton of names that we've all heard of who are going to be available on the market who have experience. Now, Jason Pierre-Paul ain't gonna come play for cheap. Like th- th- there are certain guys that you aren't that you don't think even if it gets to July, they're gonna be like, all right, I'm gonna take a two-year deal with the Falcons at this point in my career, right? So that's not realistic. But you but you look at a guy like Carlos Dunlap, right? He's just a big dude. He's 33. Benson Mayo is another guy that could come in. I'm just throwing names out here. Right. Uh, uh, Carl Nassib is another guy with some experience, maybe he can get you four or five sacks, and he can fill out your depth chart. So then. Because I came in saying, and I feel like every mock draft that I do on PFF or one of them, I'm hitting edge rusher twice, mm. three times. I've fallen in love with this guy, Cameron Thomas from San Diego State, Nick Benito from Oklahoma. And, but, you know, I, I can throw all these names out there and we can evaluate them, but we don't know who's going to be sitting there at 82 right. or 58, right? It's just that I think there are some intriguing names in the draft. But when you look back at it, I think this room needs an – needs a veteran presence really bad yeah and they could add one later on even if when you go to spot uh spot track or however you say it that you're not picking from the biggest name in the group Mm -hmm. i still think there's enough out there and i think those guys are counting on that second free agency wave post draft um to be able to clean some of those things up but they do need one and if they're not going to get one at eight if the who doesn't match what you the value that like that you need then then I think the math changes yeah. a little bit. Then they got to get a second round type of talent. Oh, yeah. Right? If you don't go edge in the first round, you have to go edge in the next three picks, period, in my opinion. You, like, I would say I w- in the second I would say that, too. Yeah. yeah. Like, you have to go – like, you just ha- – I don't understand how you wouldn't go those first three picks and not take an edge rusher in yeah. either the first or the two in the second. And I, I feel pretty confident thinking that they would mm-hmm. just because – even if we're looking big picture, they need somebody, even if he's a bit more d- uh, developmental than these top four, at least get him going. Right. So, and that's th- another thing. Like, if you get a guy in the second round, third round even, that needs to develop, at least you have the time to do it. Right. You have the time to develop him. Right. That's the thing is, I, I've been saying this a lot. I think the Falcons, are where they are in the organization right now, like, they have an opportunity to be patient. And I know that's not something that fans want to hear. Um, I know it's not a fun thing to think about the fact that your team can be patient in their decision making but I do think in a way the Falcons are in this position that I don't know if a lot of teams have been in in a few years I know the Falcons haven't you know yeah and they're not they're not kind of like chasing the dragon like they're they're not trying to press to get something that they're not really talented enough to Mm -hmm. reach but they're still striving for it it's more of it's not acceptance but it's an understanding that hey we're going to be competitive but we're also going to keep our eye on the big picture right and i think that that is an important thing so let's take all these kind of philosophical things that like that we're talking about and apply it to the wide receiver spot Mm. just like i said before talk about Tory saying one year deal, one year deal. Well, one year deal for Auden Tate and uh, Demi or Bird and uh, Kadero Hodge and OZ. every wide receiver. Yeah, well, and and Oz right, yeah. uh, who just signed his restricted free agent contract tender on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. So you've got all those people. You have Frank Darby coming back. This is another one of those, those things where you got to add somebody, mm-hmm. but you don't have to add it at eight. And the beauty of the receiver class, right, is that when you get to the – there's so many options when you look at mocks or you hear people talk about it. You're like, oh, okay, is Christian Watson a, a first-round pick? Is 
is uh, Jahan Dotson a second round pick? You know, there, there's a lot of these guys that are in this cluster, and you think, oh, he's pretty good. Yeah. And then they may move down towards 43 or towards a, a, spe- a spot in the draft where you can maybe go up and grab one that you love. My, my point is they have got to infuse talent in this wide receiver room. Yes. No choice. Yeah. Uh, and but it's they really have nice. more choices maybe – finding ways to do it right and it's really nice uh with looking at kind of the big contracts that receivers are signing recently being able to get a young guy on a rookie deal <laughs> like that's a that's great really point. big yeah, that's actually. a really big deal i think i think the wide receiver spot is, is kind of fascinating too because calvin ridley still is kind of just there there yeah, yeah. so it's like okay are is he gonna be here in 2023 you have to consider that with the the moves that you make in this year's draft based on the skill set of a guy like Garrett Wilson plays a lot like Calvin. Do you want we talked about AJ Brown uh and guys like that, big physical receivers mm-hmm. who've Arthur Smith have had in the past. If if Calvin is back, for example, do you want two guys who kind of play similarly in terms of finesse, uh, you know, quick, mm-hmm. you know, shifty receivers, or do you want a big physical guy to pair with Calvin or maybe another guy that you that you get that that is shifty in that way, and also receivers are maybe second to quarterback in terms of the most disgruntled position in the NFL. <laughs> whenever you whenever you right. turn, AJ Brown just took Tennessee out of his bio. Uh, he's not showing up to OTAs. Mm-hmm. I, that is I just not crazy. You know the new CBA players are incentivized to go, but you know who knows? Maybe he's on the market. You turn around. Someone is going to be out there. Yeah. There's right. going to – like you can bet <laughs> there's going to be a Julio's disgruntled – Julio's on the market right now. Right. There's yeah. going to be a disgruntled – I mean, I guess not a superstar anymore, but yeah. <laughs> there's going to be a disgruntled star receiver yeah. that you can get. However, you just bet. bet You can bet that it's going to happen. Yeah. So also keeping that in mind. And you can almost, almost bet that with quarterback too. Yeah. So how do you make this spot attractive? That's That's also the issue is making the spot attractive for those guys to come in or else you're going to have to pay a boatload of money mm-hmm. to get someone to come here. But, again, I think with the receiver, the, the fascinating part is how you build that, and I think how you build it determines whether or not you think Calvin is back and how you build mm-hmm. around him and Kyle and and the skill set that you want, that, that Arthur Smith wants to have in his receiving room. Yeah, and I, I think in the receiving room it has to be – more than what they saw last year, because mm-hmm. the the counter argument is, well, Kyle plays a lot of X and Y and Z and everywhere else, and they got Patterson, so the receivers are gonna be no, at no. veto, <laughs> not a real argument. No, that I if anyone no. comes at me and says anything about Kyle and anything about CP, I'm like, no, you, we can't have the conversation about the state of the wide receiver room when you're talking about a running back and a tight end. It just and it doesn't matter how the scheme is set up, you're still talking about a running back and you're still talking about a tight end. A second yeah. year tight end. Yeah, a second year tight end and. In addition to all that, let's just kill the notion right now. I've, I keep getting Julio Jones back to the Falcons God. questions. It's just because that's that's who they know. They yeah. want the jersey to come out of the closet. Yeah, nah. that is not happening. It's not going to happen. Yeah. So that's over. <laughs> Easy. Uh, and I know we're almost against time here. I, I don't want to go way down a, a, a rabbit hole here because what Chris said is there's always going to be a, a receiver or a skill player who's like upset with their situation or mm-hmm. their contractor. Christian Kirk got X much. <laughs> and it's just ruin the market for everyone, <laughs> and then everybody's mad. But I just think when I saw this AJ Brown stuff, mm-hmm. right, I immediately thought, that's a guy I'm going to sell the farm for because he already knows Arthur. He's mm-hmm. a big, powerful dude. I know he's been hurt, but and he's, he's always around 1,000 yards. It's not like he's yeah. Devontae Adams or something like that, but it depends on how much he wants. But that's one of those things where I'd be like, Okay, man. Like, let's go play out the deal. We'll we'll we'll, we'll set you up from here on out. We won't draft a, a wide receiver. <laughs> that's our play, right? Yeah. That's our number forty three pick, if that's what it takes. That yeah. that's fine with me. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not saying that that's going to happen, but that there's always going to be those options. Tyreek Hill leaves the best quarterback on planet Earth, right? Like exactly. that somehow it's- happens. So anything can happen to go to Miami and play with Tua, but I, but I just think <laughs> that was <laughs> what <laughs> question mark exclamation point I'm sorry Tua <laughs> lost our minds here, but I'm just saying well let's just take I didn't know his name was Arthur Juan Brown, but let's just take AJ that's his name yeah I guess oh and, man and then just wham 
I, I think that'd be a good way to spend your money. It's a guy who Definitely. knows Arthur and understands how he plays mm-hmm. and understands the mindset. And I think he is the – like everyone said, oh, let's go find an A.J. Brown or a Debo Samuel yeah. to fit in. They're out there. Yeah, he's, he's right there. He's a bit yeah. more expensive than Trey Lombard. Right. Right? And not right. This, but maybe a better player. But I'm just saying mm-hmm. that when we talk about these positions, right, we're looking at the draft, we're looking at free agency – Right. There's nothing to say that we can't look at these methods of yeah. acquisition, which are very common. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it's proven. I think it's more pro- – the, the Rams messed everything up. They did. They surely did. Yeah, I love it. I though. think a I love fourth the of the teams don't have a four- first-round pick or t- close to a fourth of the yeah. teams don't have a first-round pick this year. It's like it's proven that teams are willing to sacrifice draft picks for proven guys right now. To win now. To win. To win well, yeah, the Falcons aren't exactly – the Falcons are not in yeah, that exactly. point Yeah, exactly. At that point, but it, your point still remains. Yeah, yeah. To, for a better shot at winning, teams are willing to – and I think in the Falcons situation, A.J. Brown is, what, 25, 24? He is 24. Yeah. Wow. Mm. So it's not like you're you're selling the farm for Matt Stafford. Right. You're investing in a guy who could be here for – you know, who could still, you know, be in who, prime you, for five to, to seven right. more seasons, ideally. When you get to, like, 2024, and ideally you have a pretty solid roster put together that could go out and win more games. Yeah, they're, He's they're, still in his prime. Yeah, there are guys in the draft who are 24 right now yeah. who are, are going to be drafted. Like, I think Kenny Pickett is – About that. About yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so, you know. So. I, I just think all those things are, are on the table, even though when you look at – what the Falcons are going through, regaining financial flexibility, and you hear so much about doing it the old-fashioned way, through the draft, through the draft, through the draft, cheap talent, and then reward your own, right? That, that that's the, yeah. like, the, the ideal mm-hmm. utopian view of how to build a team. But I like that we're kind of getting real here, that it's, yeah. that it's okay. The Titans are a very good team by – they they tried the drafting with Marcus Mariota. It didn't out did not work out for them. But a trade for a seemingly washed up quarterback mm-hmm. from Miami paid enough divot. Well, that and drafting Derrick Henry in the second round paid enough <laughs> yeah. dividends to make it work. Or AJ Brown, another second round guy. Yeah. That's also proof. And then we'll cut out of here. When you when 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 you talk about wide receivers, you think about Devontae and Debo and AJ. Yeah. There's a lot of examples mm-hmm. of good second round people or good second round talents that have come in and made quick contributions. So there's lots of options to fix these two what I would consider major issues. There's ways to do it now. I think the moral of the story here and what we hope everybody kind of thinks about when they go through this draft, right? Everybody wants to like win week one and then every week after. And it's a it's but we have to stop thinking in a short sided way and join Arthur and Terry and looking okay down at the present product but at the horizon right because I came in thinking they got to draft two receivers and two edge rushers I don't care about anything else because I was thinking maybe incorrectly too much about the 2022 product Mm -hmm. and you brought up Tori that no man bring it back yeah I've had my second cup of coffee that's why I keep talking (laughs) but hey bring it back and look at this thing from a grander view Mm -hmm. so hopefully that's what uh, everybody else does hopefully you all enjoyed our return to the podcast and they're going to be regular now Um, we we have another one pre-draft then we got Steve Weish as a special guest coming up after the draft Um, love it so yeah guys uh, keep it locked on the website uh, for a bunch of good content coming out. Rate, review, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and we'll talk tell to you. Tell us. Wait, no. Tell us you miss us first. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Please. Please. Because yeah. mm-hmm. we miss we you We could all guys. use the ego bump. <laughs> uh, every day. I mean, I mean it, it'd me. be really nice to have a confidence boost every now and again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just every morning. Every morning. Like, Scott, you're a great guy. That's not how it works. <laughs> or, out, Chris, you're way. looking tall today. <laughs> <laughs> Short King Short Spring. Short King Spring. I, yeah, I, I, I love it. On that note, we're out of here. <laughs>